Good morning to all those watching online and welcome to church. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. Whether you're a father by genetics or simply by actions and love, we celebrate you today. Father's Day brings emotions. It can bring positive ones if you have great memories of your father or your father is a hugely important person in your life. Or possibly it can bring negative ones if you have a negative memory of things that were happening with your father or if you never got to know your father. But as believers, we know we have a heavenly father who loves us and knows our every want and need. Romans 8, 14 to 16 says, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear. Again, rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father. And the Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. You see, there's no need to whisper. You can cry out to God and he hears our cries. No matter what memories you might have associated with Father's or Father's Day, I want everyone to remember if you are a believer, you have an Abba Father in heaven. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for all the blessings that you give to us, and we thank you that you are our Abba Father. We know that you love us and you care for us. Be with us today as we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.
yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Amen. One more time we say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Amen. Oh, yes, yes, Lord. Amen. Yes, yes, Lord. Amen. Oh, yes, yes, Lord. Amen. Oh, yes, yes, Lord. Amen.
God, yes. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God, we lift you high and bow. 
Jesus. As we bow down, be lifted up, God. This Father's Day, we recognize that the best place we can be as men of God, as fathers, as sons, is bowing down before our Heavenly Father. Taking a posture of surrender and saying, God, we give our all to you. As we bow down, be lifted up. Thank you so much, EBC, for worshiping with us this morning. Just want to quickly go into our offering time and thank you once again for your faithfulness in giving to our grocery campaign, which continues to kind of be wrapping up. Thank you so much for your faithfulness in our grocery campaign. Thank you for your faithfulness to this house. And we are actually in the process of adding some new equipment to our back as we prep for reopening. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But it's because of your faithfulness to this church that we've been able to do everything that we've been doing during this COVID season. So thank you so much. To God be the glory for the things he has done. We have a few different ways to give. You can give through e-transfer as our primary way that we give at giving at ebcmeet.com. You can go to our website, ebcmeet.com, and you can give through uh, credit or debit through Canada Helps. Alternatively, you can pop into the church on Tuesday between 10 and 12, and we will receive your offering with safe drop-off. And very soon, when we're back in this house, we have a drop-off box in the back as well. So once again, we say thank you. To God be the glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for what you are doing in this season. You truly have been a faithful God, a God that has, has taken care of his children. God, thank you for the blessing that you've allowed this house to be to many during this time. God, I, I know that you know every single person's situation. You know what's going on in their lives. And God, we just ask that we can continue to be a church and a house that uses funds that reach and extend your kingdom. So God, we say uh, a special blessing on these offering and these tithes today. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, church, I just have a few quick announcements before Pastor Spencer comes and brings forth the word this Father's Day. We have a vaccine clinic that's coming up this Thursday. Uh, if you have received your vaccine doses here at the church, you should have received an email or a phone call to book your second dose to come to the church. That's not done through the church, uh, but I just want to let you know that that is coming up. Uh, volunteers have been contacted to help us with our setup. So that's just your reminder. If you are one of those volunteers, we appreciate your help as we push back COVID-19 in Nova Scotia with this vaccine clinic. Uh, church, we want to let you know that usually we have a triannual business meeting that takes place in June. And we want to inform you that our triannual business meeting has been canceled due to the current meeting restrictions due to COVID-19. However, in lieu of the meeting, we will soon be releasing an EBC newsletter that will update you on all that's going on at EBC. So you're going to get to see a picture of what's been taking place. I know many of you are plugged in. You know what's been going on, but we want to let everybody know. Also, we are so excited for the future events that are coming up at this church. We have a jam-packed summer. We're going to be welcoming back Pastor Leonard very soon. We have something coming up that I'm going to announce in a moment that we're excited about. We have our church anniversary. We have so much to look forward to EBC. And so we're excited to put out this newsletter and just present to you what's going to be coming up. And then in September, when we're able to have our general business meeting and forecast what's going to be taking place in the fall, we will gather once again for that. So I want to let you know as well, Baptisms are going to be taking place uh, in the summer, and so we are starting our baptism classes over Zoom. You can sign up for baptism classes at ebcbaptism.splashthat.com. That's ebcbaptism.splashthat.com. God willing, we're going to launch that on this Tuesday at 7 o'clock, and so if you want to be a part of that, make sure you sign up, uh, and we will make sure you are a part of that class. And lastly for this morning... Washed by the Word, Friday, July 23rd, EBC, we are excited to present Washed by the Word, Re-Engage Mid-Year 
tune-up. You remember we had our recalibrate series and we did a wash by the word that Pastor Jeremiah launched us off with our recalibrate series. Well, we are doing a mid-year tune-up in our recalibrate series and throwing back to that with a new theme, re-engage. We will be back in person at that point and we are excited to welcome evangelist Jesse Holmes to EBC. He is a powerful speaker with the gift of evangelism, and he has a word for us on July 23rd. We will have more to say about reopening and what's coming uh, very soon in the coming weeks, so stay tuned to our EBC News mail-out, and we will let you know about what's going to be taking place this summer. But we are just excited. Mark your calendars, July 23rd. Re-engage with evangelist Jesse Holmes. You're going to want to book your seat for that. We are excited. We are just looking forward to what God's going to do. I will see you again soon. Good morning, church. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers and father figures out there. Be blessed today. Someone who is a good sport, um, someone who laughs with me, and someone who plays with me and prays with me. I humbly say, because I I'm obviously working on these qualities myself, but I think a dad needs to be a great leader and protector and lover. Needs to protect the family, love the family, and lead the family. And uh, I think that's what makes a great dad. Well, I think it's someone who can set a positive example for the children to follow, someone that they can look up to, just being there for them and uh, just letting them know that you love them and that you're supporting them through good times and bad times and helping them develop a personal uh, relationship with Jesus and to know that they have a Heavenly Father in Heaven who loves them. I think being a good dad means being helpful and kind. Um, he taught me how to play basketball and to play pranks and to love God. And one thing my dad taught us um, of being a father is always be, be protective of your family. So always check up on them and support them. My dad, up to, up to this day, my dad called each one of us to check up on us and where we're at. So, yes, that's one thing about being a dad. To just support them and just be there for them. Right? Right? He taught me how to play basketball. What do I like about being a grandfather? Well, I like everything about being a father, a grandfather, and a great grandfather. And I just love having the kids over. I love spending time with them. I love the way they give me hugs and kisses and cuddles. I love all the fun that we have together. And when they sleep over and the next day I'm tired, and I can just send them home. Being a dad is, is awesome. I love, I love kids. So, and God bless us with this handsome fellow. Keep me active every time. Look, look at him. What do I love about being a dad? Well, I can tell you this, that kids think their dad is Superman, and that's a good feeling. I'm the strongest man in the world. I'm the smartest man in the world. Uh, I'm the best man in the world, the best dad in the world, and I think my kids genuinely believe that. So the faith and the trust and they love and the admiration they have you is probably one of the best feelings. Well, I think it's important to be present, both mentally and physically, and to just spend quality time with the kids and show them that you care, that you're there for them, and just be a, just just be genuine, just be, be fun, just be uh, approachable, and just let them know that uh, Dad loves them. Happy Father's Day, everyone. have passed.
cast away your love has stayed the same your constant grace remains the cornerstone things that we find life again you cause your sun to shine on darkest night for all that you've done we will pour out our love this will be the anthem song Jesus we
Father, we do love you this morning. We thank you for all that you have done for us. We thank you for this service. God, I just pray right now that you would bless Pastor Spencer as he brings forth the word. Anoint him today and have him spe- speak a fresh word of life into us this morning. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Well, EBC, I am proud to introduce a good friend of mine, Pastor Spencer Conway. Pastor Spencer Conway serves as the youth pastor at Rock Church Halifax. He's been married to his wife, Sarah, for four years, and together they lead Shiloh Youth. He is passionate about helping Generation Z grow into healthy Christians with a faith that engages their head, hands, and heart. Pastor Spencer graduated from Acadia Divinity College in 2018 with a Bachelor of Theology, and he is a student of the Word. And this isn't in his bio, but if I must say, uh, this brother has a YouTube channel on how to read God's Word and on Bible reading plans. If you're looking for more information on reading God's Word, check out Pastor Spencer's YouTube channel. i got to give him a plug because it is a great channel. I consider him a colleague and a friend. Would you please give him a warm welcome from your home today? Welcome, Pastor Spencer Conway. Good morning, EBC. Happy Father's Day. I am so, so excited that I have the opportunity to be with you today. We're going to have an awesome time today. Uh, You may not know who I am, but I bet some of you know who my dad is, and it's fitting that I could start the message off this way. My name is actually Spencer Conway, and my dad is is, uh, Russ Conway. I think that he's been here a few times before in the past preaching in this this, uh, church, and so it's kind of cool that on Father's Day of all days, now I get to be here Pastor Russ's son preaching a message on Father's Day. What a joy it is to be with you this morning. And I'm just so thankful for the power of technology that in this crazy season we have been through because of video cameras and editing and and Facebook and YouTube and all these things, we're still able to worship together as a church on Sundays. It's so cool. I'm so excited that I have the opportunity to preach a message today on Father's Day. And so with that being said, I want to jump right into this because I believe that God has a word for you this morning. I believe he's going to speak directly to your heart, and I believe you're going to be challenged and encouraged. And so if you're taking notes this morning, I want to encourage you to write this down as the title of this morning's message. Write this down, The Perfect Father. That's what we're talking about this morning. We're talking about the perfect father on Father's Day. And I want to start off by reading our main text, which is found in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 to 13. It says this, reading from the New King James Version, In this manner, therefore, pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, I believe, we believe that this Bible is unlike any other book because within it, contains the very Word of God inspired by the Holy Spirit. And I'm praying that in this moment, you would enable me, God, 
you would enable us, God, to understand the words of Jesus that were recorded by Matthew so many years ago. And I pray, God, that beyond just grasping the meaning of these words, I pray that you would help us to learn how to live them out in our day-to-day -day lives. I pray that you would change us and transform us more and more into the image of Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. The perfect Father. This morning we're talking about the perfect father. You know, recently my wife and I have been talking about having kids. Now, I asked my wife Sarah to marry me when I was 18, believe it or not. I'm that kind of guy, a little crazy, live life on the edge. We got married 14 months later, only six days after I had turned 20. Our plan when we first got married was to enjoy married life just between the two of us for about five years. And we thought, hey, by the time we're 25, that'll be a good opportunity to start trying to have kids. Now, to put things into perspective uh, in terms of like where we're at in this plan, just last month, I turned 24, and next month in July, Sarah is turning 25. So if you do the math, that means that kids should be right around the corner. Now, this probably would leave both my parents and her parents with an unruly amount of excitement. So if we could leave this as just our little secret, that would be very, very helpful. But you know what, if I'm being honest, this kind of makes me excited as well. Especially when I think about my little niece, Sienna, my brother Morgan and his wife, Anna Lee, about two years ago, they had their baby Sienna. And this was my mom and dad's first grandchild. Such an exciting moment in the, the life of our family. And Sienna, I'm telling you, maybe, maybe you've seen pictures of her on Facebook before, maybe not, but she is, she is like the prettiest little girl you've ever laid your eyes on. She's got this spunky personality. She's fearless. She's smart. She, she's got this spirit for adventure. And every time I FaceTime my brother Morgan and I, and I get to see little Sienna, th there's something that just rises up within me where I'm just like, man, I have this desire to become a father. I don't really know what it is, but, but there's, there's something about laying your eyes on your own flesh and blood that makes the possibility of fatherhood feel so real. I mean, most times when I look at Sienna, I just think to myself, like, dang, I want one, you know? Like, I'll, I'll nudge Sarah and be like, Sarah, can we have one, please? Can we have one, please? Now, as true as it may be that there are times when I feel excited about fatherhood, the truth is there are many other times where the thought of fatherhood actually leaves me overwhelmed by a different feeling altogether. On those downcast days when I feel inadequate, in those wayward weeks when I feel unworthy, in those sinking seasons when I feel ashamed, it's during those times that I can't imagine being a father. I can't imagine raising a child of my own. It's during those times that I actually feel afraid, afraid a fatherhood. I wonder, have you ever felt that way? Pastor John Tyson reflects on a similar experience he had when he and his wife paid a visit to the doctor's office to actually find out the birth sex of their firstborn. He writes, the tech turned to us with a smile on her face and asked the question we had both been waiting for. Do you want to know the sex of your child? We looked at each other, grinning nervously, and Christy nodded. This was a big moment. Yeah, I said, go on. I could feel the blood rushing in my ears. Okay, the technician said. Well, congratulations, it's a boy. It's a boy. And with those words, a feeling washed over me that I hadn't expected. Not joy or relief or excitement. I wasn't thinking of teaching my son sports someday or what it would be like to go to a concert with him. I wasn't looking forward to showing him how to ride a bike or taking him camping. No, the primary thing I felt in that moment 
was overwhelming anxiety. How will I ever have what it takes to be the kind of father my son needs? How will I teach him all the things he needs to know? How will I not let him down? I think most men can probably relate to this on some level. I mean, some of you dads probably listened to me read that story of Pastor John Tyson's experience. Maybe you remember exactly what that felt like. Or maybe you're like me and fatherhood is still far off, but, but the thought of it tends to bring you fear. Or perhaps you've been a father or a grandfather for years, and yet you still struggle to know if you raised your kids up right. If you're like me, you might wonder, will I be any good at fatherhood? Or if you're already a father, you might wonder, am I any good at fatherhood? Many times we, we get fixated on our failures, we stare at our mistakes, we remember our regrets, and we start to wonder if we're any good at this thing called fatherhood at all. And so what do we do with this, right? Like, like what do we do with this feeling, this experience that many men have? Well, listen, today I can't talk to you as an expert on fatherhood. I don't have any kids, as we've already discovered. I've never been a dad. Lord knows, I have a lot to learn over the next few years when I eventually do become a father with children of my own. But here's the thing. Today, I have no intention of trying to speak to you as an expert on fatherhood. Rather, I want to speak to you from the perspective of a son. I want to speak to you from the perspective of a kid who grew up with a father who wasn't perfect, but who gave me what I believe to be the single most important thing any father could ever give to their kids. You see, my dad wasn't the perfect father, but he had a relationship with the perfect father. And really, this is what I want to encourage you with this morning, more than anything else I say. Your kids don't need you to be the perfect father. They need you to know and stay close to the perfect father. I want to say that one more time. Your kids don't need you to be the perfect father. They need you to know and stay close to the perfect father. Scripture shows us that God is the perfect Father. In fact, Jesus is the one who came to reveal this God to us. Not as some distant deity, not as some obscure spiritual being, but as a loving Heavenly Father, as the perfect Father. In fact, Jesus himself referred to God as Father over 175 times in the four Gospels. Like, like that's incredible. That's amazing. And when we look at the Sermon on the Mount, for example, we read Jesus saying things like this. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, he says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Or in Matthew 6, 26, Jesus says, Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Or what about Matthew chapter 7, verse 11, where Jesus says, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Or, fitting for this morning's message, Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, where Jesus says, Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Jesus makes it clear to us that the perfect Father does, in fact, exist. No human has ever reached this feat, and that's because no human ever could. Rather, God is perfect the perfect father. And in light of this truth, here's the question burning on my heart this morning. 
Since God is the perfect father, what is he like? What is our perfect heavenly father like? And for that question, I want to turn towards our main passage found in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 to 13. Our main passage this morning contains what has come to be known as the Lord's Prayer. In Luke's gospel, we actually see that Jesus shared this teaching about prayer with his disciples in response to a question that they had for him. They asked Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. Presumably, they asked this to Jesus because his prayer life was so vibrant and so passionate. There was something about the way that Jesus prayed that was different than anything they had ever seen before, and they wanted to have a prayer life like his. And so, Jesus responds to this question with a prayer many of us know off by heart. And if you know it, I want to encourage you right now. Would you, would you just take a moment and say it with me? Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 to 13, the Lord's Prayer. It goes like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now normally in my experience, I've found that when we look at this passage, the Lord's Prayer, the first thing we tend to focus on is what we need to do, right? Like it's the Lord's Prayer. It's a, it's a pattern for us to follow. We need to pray like Jesus. We need to follow his example. We need to pattern our prayer life after what Jesus has modeled here for us. And to be clear, that is 100% true. We need to learn to pray like Jesus. We should absolutely do this. We, we should absolutely integrate this into our lives. I don't know about you, but I definitely want to have a prayer life that's like the prayer life of Jesus. However, with all that being said, today, I actually want to highlight something different. See, because the Lord's Prayer doesn't only teach us how to pray, it also teaches us who God is. I want to say that one more time. The Lord's Prayer, it doesn't just teach us how to pray, it also teaches us who God is. It teaches us what God the Father is like. And so what does the Lord's Prayer show us about the nature of God? What does it show us about his character, about his attributes? Let's take a closer look together. That first line in the Lord's Prayer goes like this. Our Father in heaven. Jesus begins his prayer by addressing God as Father, using a term of intimacy. And so first we see that God, the perfect Father, is personal and present. Hallowed be your name. Next, Jesus uses the word hallowed, which speaks to God's holiness. Jesus essentially is telling us that there is nothing, I repeat, nothing bad about God. Here we see that God, the perfect Father, is pure. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Next, Jesus shows us that God is the king who rules heaven. He's the king of kings. And we see here then that God, the perfect father, is powerful. Give us this day our daily bread. Jesus includes in his prayer a request for daily provision. This would have evoked memories of Israel's story as God provided manna for the Israelites every day as they journeyed through the wilderness towards the promised land. And here we see that God, the perfect Father, is our provider. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Jesus teaches us that we need to confess our sin and ask for forgiveness, which implies something so, so important. God wants to forgive us. God longs to forgive us. This shows us that God, the perfect Father, is one who pardons. Last but not least, we read, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. We, he, we see here, 
that God longs to protect us. Though suffering undoubtedly will come, God will have the final word in our story. Here we see that God, the perfect Father, is our protector. So, does the perfect Father exist? Yes. And, and what is the perfect Father like? God, our perfect Father, is personal. He's present. He's powerful. He's our provider. He's the one who pardons us, and he's the one who protects us. Here I want to remind you, your kids don't need you to be the perfect father. They need you to know and stay close to the perfect father. They need, to, they need you to know they need to know rather that you know the perfect father who is personal, who is present, who is powerful, who is our provider, who is the one who pardons, who is the one who protects us. Do you know the perfect father? Can your kids see that this relationship is the most important part of your life? There's two things I remember about my dad that helped me know that the most important thing to him was his relationship with God. You want to know something? It wasn't the fact that he preached from a stage every Sunday morning. Maybe I could just start by sharing one example of, of a way in which my dad showed me that the most important thing in his life was his relationship with God the Father. My mom and dad, they had their hands full raising four boys. I repeat, four boys. Just let that sink in for a moment. Now, I'm the youngest of the four, and we were all within two years of each other, except for Tristan and Morgan, who were the middle uh, children. They were about the same age. Now, you can probably imagine how crazy that would be, raising four boys. Not only that, but my mom actually ran an in-home daycare for the first 15 years of her life. So suffice it to say, our home life growing up was a little chaotic, a little crazy. And you know, like any parent, there were times when my dad's temper got the best of him. I'm sure there were times he said some things that he shouldn't have said, you know, even though, to be honest, I don't really remember specifically. But you want to know what I do remember about my dad? even in light of the moments that he may have lost his temper or said things he shouldn't have, this is what I remember. I remember that every time my dad lost his temper with us or made a mistake of some kind, he would always, always come to us afterwards. And he'd sit us down as little boys, and he would ask us to forgive him. He'd ask his little children, his four little boys, a full-grown man, He'd ask us to forgive him. Man, that is interesting to me. He'd look at us and he'd say, hey, guys, dad made a mistake. I'm sorry. I love you. Will you please forgive me? And from the time that I was a toddler into my later teenage years, my dad always modeled a Christ-like humility that has stuck with me to this day. And I don't know about you, but, but I think that a man who's humble enough to ask his children for forgiveness is a man that has to know and be close to the perfect father. I didn't need my dad to be the perfect father. I needed him to know and stay close to the perfect father. And your kids don't need you to be the perfect father. They need you to know and stay close to the perfect father. You know, as I think about my relationship with my dad, there's so much that comes to my mind. And like I already said, I, I am well aware that I didn't have a perfect father. My dad has made as many mistakes as, as any guy has, as any dad has. You know, in human terms, we've already established this. There's no such thing as the perfect father. But even still, I can say with 100% confidence that I have had and continue to have an amazing father who set an amazing example for me in the way that he focused on his relationship with God as the most important aspect of his life. But as I reflect, you know, I can't help but wonder, what was it about my dad that made him such a great father? Why is it that 
even with his imperfections, he left such an impact. What's his secret to fatherhood? He may not put it this way, but I'll tell you what, as somebody who observed him behind closed doors for the first 20 years of my life, I think I know his secret. I want to share it with you. I want to share with you my dad's secret to fatherhood. I think my dad's secret to fatherhood is sonship. I think my dad became a great father because he learned to be God's son. See, because before any of us became the fa- uh, the father, uh, b- sorry, before any of us became the fathers, God calls us to be. There has to be a revelation that through the person and work of Jesus Christ, in his life, death, and resurrection, we've been adopted into God's family as his children. Because of Jesus' death on the cross and his forgiveness for your sin, the way has been made for you to be adopted as God's son. John 1, 12 to 13 tells us, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. Paul wrote in Galatians 4, verses 4 to 5, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of, a, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And again in Romans 8, 14 to 16, Paul writes, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Before you are a father, you need to have a revelation that you are God's son. And I believe that this was my dad's secret to fatherhood. It was sonship. So dads, this is my question for you this morning. Do you see that you are a son? Do you see that you are God's child? God wants you to have a revelation this morning that before you are a father, first and foremost, you are God's son. It's in that place the place of learning to be God's son, knowing and staying close to the perfect father. It's in that place where God will empower you to become the father he desires. Your kids don't need you to be the perfect father. They need you to know and stay close to the perfect father. They need you to show them how to be sons and daughters. My dad was imperfect, And yet he left an impact, and yet he he continues to have an impact. And it's because he showed me how to be a son. He showed me how to be God's son. In the way that he lived, in the way that he talked, in the way that he composed himself throughout the challenges and the trials that life threw his way, my dad showed me how to be God's son because he knew that he was God's son. And so, if your kids need you to show them how to be sons and daughters, the question we must ask is how can we learn to be God's children? How can we learn to be God's son, God's daughter? How do we model this in our own lives? See, while we may have a revelation that we are God's son in an instant, living like God's son is actually a process that we have to learn over an entire lifetime. But there's three things that my dad showed me about what it means to be God's son, and I want to share that with you this morning. The first thing I learned from my dad is that sons receive. Sons receive. Sons learn how to receive from God. You know, from a young age, children, they receive literally everything they need from their parents. There's an absolutely complete and total dependence on the parents for for anything and and everything. And in the same way, we need to learn to receive from God. God's children are those who have received the love and the grace of God. And this is not a one-time thing. As God's children, we are welcomed into a lifetime of receiving God's love and God's grace over and over and over again. I mean, just this week, I had a moment where I experienced and I received the love and the grace of God again. 
I don't know about you, but, but, but this has been a season of weariness. This has been a season of fatigue with COVID and, and this pandemic and all of the changes and all of the pivoting. And, and there's just been moments where it's just weighed heavy on my heart. And I just, I got up one morning this week and I went out to spend some time with God in my backyard, sitting at our little table. And I opened up to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and I read the passage in verses 4 to 8 where Paul describes love. He says, love is patient, love is kind. He goes on. And as I'm sitting there and as I'm praying and as I'm, as I'm meditating and contemplating on this passage, I begin to realize that, that ultimately because God is love, this is in many ways a description of God's character, of God's, of God's care towards me. And, and I started thinking about and reflecting on the fact that, that God is patient towards me, that God is kind towards me, that God has no records of my wrongs, that, that God, uh, he has endured all things throughout my life up until this point. And I just, I just began to weep in this moment as I was reminded of the grace and the love of God for me, as I, as I just began to open up my heart and receive his grace and receive his love once again. But many of us learn to relate to God, not primarily as sons, but as servants. We received God's love at one point, but somewhere along the way, things switched. And our whole relationship with God becomes about work, 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 do, 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 serve, serve, serve. Sometimes you might begin to think of yourself more as a slave than a son. Now, I want to be clear about something. Scripture makes it clear that we're called to serve God. We're called to be servants of God. But we need to make sure we know the proper place of our service. See, because our service can't come before sonship. We're not serving God to earn sonship. We're serving God from a place of sonship. We're not serving God to earn his grace and love. We're serving God because we've received his grace and love. So my question for you this morning is, is your posture, is the posture of your heart towards God one of receiving or one of serving? Both are important. But our serving for God must flow from a life of receiving from God as his child, receiving his love and his grace on a daily basis. The second thing I learned from my dad is this, sons trust. Sons tr learn to trust God. When you're a child, you basically have to trust your parents. And one thing that I admire about kids is how naturally this trust seems to come to them. They just naturally trust their parents. But for some reason, as we grow and we experience disappointment, we get disillusioned, we feel discouraged, soon it becomes hard for us to trust. Sons, uh, but Jesus calls us to have childlike faith. This is a trust that's like that of a child. It's not a blind faith that we put in God without any reason. Rather, it's a trust that comes from good reason, a knowledge of who God is and what God does. Sons know they can trust God because of who he is. He's literally perfect. He's holy. There's nothing bad about him. He's all-powerful, all-present, all-knowing, completely good, and he wants the best for our lives as Scripture consistently reveals to us. Not only is his character perfect, but his faithfulness in our lives and the lives of countless others has been constant throughout the years. And as I sat in my backyard this week reflecting on God's love and God's grace, my thoughts began to quickly turn towards my story and all the ways God has been so good to me over the years. He healed me in my mother's womb. He comforted me through the loss of my brother. I could go on about the stories of what God has done in my life. Time wouldn't allow it, unfortunately. But what about you? When was the last time you remembered the faithfulness of God in your life? When was the last time you recalled how his hand has been at work throughout the years? When we know who God is and what God does, we're able to begin trusting him as his children, as his sons. The last thing my dad has shown me about what it means to be a son is this. Sons grow. Not only do sons receive, not only do sons trust, but sons grow. They learn to grow. You know, just as earthly mothers and fathers have the goal of raising mature kids who will one day be able to leave home and make a meaningful impact in the world around us, God too desires us to grow up into maturity so that we can one day make a kingdom impact in his world. As Paul puts it in Philippians 1 chapter, uh, chapter 1 verse 6, 
I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. This verse shows me something very simple, that God's agenda for my life and your life is growth. God's agenda for my life and your life is growth. And this isn't the kind of growth the world talks about that's man-centered. No, kingdom growth is Christ-centered. God wants to form you and shape you and mold you more and more into the image of Jesus Christ. He wants to cultivate the character of Christ in your life. He wants to change and transform your heart so that the fruit of the Spirit will flow out of you everywhere you go. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I want you to just think about for a moment how messed up it would be if me, as a 24-year-old, was still in diapers, living at home, pooping in my pants, wetting the bed, and drinking from a bottle. That would be absolutely ridiculous, wouldn't it be? As my parents raised me, the expectation was for me to grow. Guess what? It's the same for us as Christians When we were born again, adopted into God's family as his very own children, we became spiritual babes. God doesn't want us drinking from bottles for the rest of our lives. He wants us fighting in battles. Amen? He wants us to grow. And so as God's sons, we must learn to grow. And this is why we need humility and grace. We need to ask God to help us to be humble. Humble people are okay to admit that they're that they have faults, and they're okay to ask for help from others and from God in in overcoming those faults. And this is really what's so amazing about God's grace, is, is this reminds us that we don't have to do this by ourselves. God is the one who started the good work in you, and God is the one who is going to carry it on to completion. And yet, so yes, you have a part to play, but God by his grace is the one who is leading you. I want to remind you this morning, your kid doesn't need you to be the perfect father. They need you to know and stay close to the perfect father. They need you to show them how to be a son and a daughter. Show them that sons are those who trust God, who receive from God, and who grow with God. As we close, I want to share you one more story about the impact that my father had on my life as he raised me. When I was in my first year of Bible college, I realized that I needed to begin practicing confession. That is to say, the practice of confessing my sin to other people. I knew that God wanted me to grow and that this spiritual discipline had to be a part of that process. I struggled though with the thought of sharing some of my deepest and darkest secrets, even with a person who I trusted even with people I knew were safe, but I decided that I needed to start. At the same time, the only person I could imagine myself confessing my sin to was my father. Even so, thoughts began to plague my mind. What will he do? What will he say? What will he think of me? I wouldn't be surprised if my dad was embarrassed of me when he found out these things. He's going to be disappointed in me. He's going to be ashamed of me. But I still remember the moment as I stood in his office, shaking, crying, the words barely able to escape from my mouth. And then, as quickly as the confession left my lips, My dad looked at me with love in his eyes. He looked at me with love and he wrapped his arms around me in a warm embrace. He hugged me tightly and he didn't say anything at first, but soon after a little bit of silence, four words came out of his mouth. I love you, son. I love you, son. This was one of the most transformative moments in my life as my dad literally modeled the love of God the Father for me in real time. I believe his response to me in that moment was an example of God the Father's response to me every time I confessed my sin to him. And what is it that prepared my dad to respond to me in this way at that moment? 
I think it's simple. Somewhere along the way, my dad had a revelation that before he was a father, first and foremost, he was God's son. And as a man who grounded his identity in sonship, as a man who had learned to receive from God the Father, to trust God the Father, to grow with God the Father, when his earthly son was in need of him, he was able to give me the most important thing I needed. A man who wasn't the perfect father, but a man who knew and, and was close to the perfect father. Your kids don't need you to be the perfect father. They need you to know and stay close to the perfect father. They need you to show them how to be sons and daughters. Let's pray together. God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that you are the perfect father. I pray God for every dad watching, whatever their journey has looked like, whatever mistakes they've made, whatever regrets they may have, in any feelings of inadequacy, in any feelings of shame, I pray by your spirit right now in this moment, would you break through and bring a revelation of sonship would you break through, God, and bring a revelation that before we are fathers, we are your sons. And I pray, God, that this revelation would permeate to the core, would permeate to the depths of our very being, that we would have identities that are rooted and grounded and established in sonship, in the reality that we are your children. And I pray, God, that you would enable the fathers of this house to model sonship for their children, to model sonship for their sons and their daughters, that you would enable the fathers in this house to lead in such a way where their kids can look at them and they can see that even though they may not have perfect fathers, they have dads who know and are close to the perfect father. And that when the going gets tough, they know that they have fathers who are in relationship to the one who will empower them to be the parents you desire them to be. God, I pray for a revelation of sonship. I pray it would permeate the minds and the hearts and the souls of every father watching right now in this moment. We pray that it would be done according to your will. In the mighty, the mighty name of Jesus, amen and amen. Oh, I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and i'm loved by you it's who i am it's who i am it's who i am you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. 
is who you are, is who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You're a good, good father, it's who you are. It's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, Lord, it's who I am. 